You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. And hello, listeners, and welcome to episode 95 of the Common Descent Podcast. Hey, that ends in a five. It ends in a five, which means that this is, following our tradition, an episode about extinction. This episode's topic is the Carboniferous Rainforest Collapse. That sounds like an extinction. It sure is. Now, uh, we've been doing this extinction tradition since the beginning. This episode is a very special extinction episode for two reasons, which I'll get into in a bit. But first, the Carboniferous Rainforest Collapse was an extinction event that happened at the end of the Carboniferous period, about 300 million years ago, and it's a very biome-focused extinction, right? The, the, as the name implies, we lost a lot of those characteristic Carboniferous rainforests and plant biomes, and they were replaced, and in the process, we lost a lot of plant species and animal species. There's a whole turnover as you move into the Permian period. So, it, as we do with most extinction episodes, we'll talk about what happened, why it happened, and how the world changed in the process. Sounds good. This episode was requested uh, a surprising number of times for an event that I knew nothing about <laughs> before this by three of our patrons, Thomas, Lydia, and Eric, and Ivana. Thanks. You're all more informed than we are. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Now, I said that this is a very special ed edition to our extinction tradition for two reasons. Number one, we're not doing it alone. We aren't. Hi, Allie. Hi, guys. I am so proud of myself for being quiet the whole time to not ruin the surprise. <laughs> I, noted, I, I said some funny things, and I saw you, like, having to not laugh. It has been, like, a year since you were last here. Uh, people who listen to the podcast will know that Allie is our favorite paleobotanist who we bring on to talk about plants. But in the year since you were last here, you have become Dr. Allie Baumgartner. It's true. My graduation was recently. So, like, I legitimately am now a doctor. And it's pretty cool, i got to admit. It is. Well, congratulations. <laughs> Thanks for coming back. Oh, thank you. I you haven't been here <laughs> because you were in the process of becoming Dr. Uh, Baumgartner. This is this is true. Also, full disclosure, uh, David did not wait long until I was after I was done <laughs> to be like, will you please come back? <laughs> Listen, we made a d after episode 73 about trees. You yeah. said, don't ask me to do anything else until after I'm done with my Ph.D., because I'll say yes. And I said, deal. And then I watched your PhD <laughs> dissertation and they said you passed. And I went, excellent. <laughs> That's what and happened. 95 yes. was right around the corner. And we were just about to do it. <laughs> now, we are super excited to have you back. But the second reason why this episode is a very special addition to our long running extinction list is that it is also the last one. Yeah, it is the closure of the tradition. We have been doing this every episode that ends in a five is an extinction episode since the beginning. And you know what? We're about to hit triple digits. We were looking at our list of extinction requests, and it's been getting really sparse. Mm -hmm. And we thought, you know, we are not going to, like, never do extinction episodes again. Nope. We, we've got more. Keep those requests coming. But, it, I, you know, it seems like a good time... To, to lay this tradition to rest, let it go out on its on its own terms. Ten episodes in, right before we get to triple digits, this will be the official end of our extinction tradition. Yes. But we are not ones to let a tradition go unreplaced. Yeah, you have to fill a niche when we it get, is Yes, exactly. <laughs> that's right. We're, we're opening a space. <laughs> <laughs> and we were looking at our list of requests. Yep. And you know what? general broad subject has a whole lot going in it i know the one that we that neither of us are prepared to speak a lot on hey ali <laughs> would you like to join us for every five episode in the coming future to talk about plants oh yes very much y'all need to talk about plants more <laughs> <laughs> then it is official starting with episode 105 our new episodes that ended in number five tradition will be plants so if you like Allie, 
You're stuck with me. Good. Yeah. You're ready to hear a lot more. Yeah. <laughs> if not, what's wrong with you? <laughs> But seriously, we are super happy to have you here for this episode. We are thrilled uh, that you have agreed to help us uh, forge forward with this tradition. And, you know, we'll touch base on episode 195 and see what we want to do, you know, after that. (laughs) I love it. I look forward to it. So if you have plant requests, start sending them in. Now, uh, we have a bunch of announcements to get through. Yes. We have the news to do. So, Allie... Uh, let's we'll touch base with you again after our announcements and news to get into our main topic. Wonderful. See you in a bit. Hey, Will. Yeah. We have a Patreon. We do. And if you sign up with our Patreon at a certain level, one of the things we like to do is say your name on the podcast. So this episode, we are shouting out Clara, RZ, and Dawn. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Hey, if you join us on Patreon, you get all sorts of goodies like bonus audio stuff and extra behind the scenes things and like we did been doing director's notes you get your own special uh, rss feed for e- extra stuff on your podcast app it's pretty cool check it out if you'd like and you get all of our gratitude for your support and yeah we will say your name sometimes <laughs> before we move on a couple of announcements number one it's the beginning of september yep dragon con We've been talking about Dragon Con a little bit. Dragon Con has gone virtual this year, so we are not going to Atlanta to go to Dragon Con, but we are Dragon Conning from home. Yes. We have two events, two presentations that you can check out. One is on Friday, September 4th, which by the time this episode comes out will already have happened, Mm -hmm. but you can check it out on the Dragon Con YouTube channel. There will be links on our social medias. That presentation is just the two of us pre-recorded about movie monsterification. And we had such a good time doing it. If you've listened to our Silver Screen Science episodes, you've heard us talk about this. We really like it. The second one is Sunday afternoon, Sunday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, which, if you've downloaded this episode and are listening to it early, (laughs) you might actually still have time to catch it. But if not, it'll also be up on the YouTube channel. That is our Ask About Paleontology live panel. This year, it's the two of us. Karen Henning, Mm -hmm. science illustrator, uh, awesome person who was with us. Extraordinaire. Extraordinaire. She was with us last year. And this year, Riley Black. Whose name has been on the podcast A bunch. (laughs) Riley Black is a science writer, SciComm superstar, and just all around really cool person. And it's just just a great lineup, uh, if we do say so ourselves. Uh, and also these other two awesome people. <laughs> That's uh, going to be live Q&A. So like I said, check it out when it airs if you can. If not, check it out afterwards. Uh, we're excited to be part of Dragon Con this year, uh, even even from afar. In fact, being afar has let us do some fun things. Absolutely. And yeah, pandemic or no, we will not be stopped from Dragon Conning. You're darn right. Hey, you know what else is coming up? October. It is. And you know what we do in October? Spooky. That's right. Hey, we've done this two years in a row, and why stop now? Yeah, now it's an actual tradition. Now it's a tradition. Spooculative evolution. Uh, we have a theme in mind for this year. We're not going to announce it just yet, yeah. because we're going to let you let you sit for a little bit. But Saturdays throughout October, keep an eye out for extra... We're going to do speculative evolution about monsters. Yeah, how might we evolve some of our favorite monsters in different genres? exciting stuff. Hey, that's plenty of announcements for this episode. Want to talk about news? Okay. Every episode we like to talk about news from paleontology, evolution, fossils, etc. The kind of stuff that we like, the kind of stuff that we assume our listeners like since they listen to this podcast. Will, what news do you bring? Crocodiles. Well, I don't know what I expected. Dot gif. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a shtick and I've got to stick to it. This is actually about a crocodile bite on a ground sloth bone that has recently been identified as crocodile. This is research by Francois Pujos and Rodolfo Salas Gizmondi in Royal Society. And the article is by Ashley Strickland at CNN. And so this is about a tibia, a leg bone, from a ground sloth that's about 13 million years old. So not super old, but from the Napu River in Peru, or near the Napu River in Peru, so South America, 
and it was found in rock outcrops from the the Pebas Formation. And this was discovered a while ago, in 2004. So the tibia is not new. And when it was discovered, it was very obvious that something had bit it. It had 46 tooth marks. Wow. So like a good bite. In a row? I don't know if they were in a row or if they were scattered. Right, were they multiple yeah, bites? But it it was 46 tooth imprints. So either it was a lot of bites or it was a very toothy mouth. Right. <laughs> <laughs> this research is on the fact that they finally analyzed and have proposed an identity to the biter. Ah, uh, I bet it's a shark. Uh, you would hope so, except it's not. It's better. Giant snake. It is... Anaconda. A crocodile, because during the time of that this ground sloth would have been alive, there are multiple predators that could have been chomping on it. Big predatory marsupials were down there. Oh, yeah, they were. And terror birds were down there. Also true. But terror birds lack teeth. Yep. So tooth marks would be weird for them to leave behind. That's true. And none of the marsupials' teeth are big enough to have left these tooth marks. Mm. So that leaves crocs, which yeah. are a huge group of predators down in South America. That's the hot spot for crocs. Also among the animal kingdom's best biters. Yes. <laughs> so they analyzed the teeth from different types of ancient crocodiles and caimans to see which one best fit the tooth marks they had. And only one had teeth robust enough, thick enough to leave the substantial marks on this bone, and that was Purusaurus. Yeah, we've talked about that. The caiman. The, the, the main caiman. This is a massive species of ancient caiman that grew up to and upwards of 30 feet long, so 10 meters. Yeah, this is one of those, like, top five croc heavyweights. Where the, the skull is the size of an adult human. And ranged in South America from the early to late Miocene, so 20 to 5 million years ago. Now, the bite on the bone suggests not a full-grown Purusaurus, but a juvenile, uh, or at least a sub-adult that would have probably only been about 13 feet long. Oh, okay. You know, uh, four meters. That explains why it was hunting such puny prey it's, like ground sloths. It's a, a measly record, <laughs> you know, holding an alligator. Yep. All the other crocodiles that would have been in this area were either too small at adult size, you know, because caimans typically are smaller. The black caiman gets up to this size, but most don't. Most get up not above 10 feet. Or had wrong-shaped teeth. Right. So, Prusaurus is the only one who seems to get big enough and have the right-shaped teeth to have left this mark. And this is exciting because, as we've mentioned, it's typically really hard to connect a trace fossil, trace evidence to an actual individual species. Absolutely. So, this is exciting. The ground sloth, which is known as Pseudoprepatherium, which would have been about 80 kilograms or 176 pounds, which is similar size to the very largest sizes recorded for capybaras, which are the giant rodents in South America today. Uh, which caimans eat. Yes. And so uh. capybaras, the biggest size that I found for them was 150 pounds, so just slightly... Yeah, less than this. Similar to the estimates here. Though most don't get up to that size. Right. But they can. So this would have potentially been a similar feeding scenario. Oh, interesting. According to the bone, the ground sloth did not survive this attack. Oh. There are no signs of healing on the bite marks. So the ground sloth was not alive after this bite. Yeah, certainly not for very long. We In episode 84, you'll recall that I think Laura said that it's about two weeks that it's difficult to differentiate mm -hmm. between if the death happened right away or within the next couple of weeks after the bite. Uh, uh, presumably it wasn't eaten by the croc, or at least it wasn't fully eaten yes. by the croc, because if it was, we wouldn't have a tibia. Exactly. Now, they also men mentioned that we can't confirm that this was attack and not feeding after death. This could True. have been a scavenging bite that was after this sloth was dead for some other reason. Mm -hmm. So that can't be confirmed. That's always really difficult to confirm. But it does reveal that prior to getting max sized, they were still, Prurosaurus was still taking on big prey. Yeah. And so it gives us a little insight into how their feeding might have shifted as their size shifts, which is 
one of the famous things with crocs and gators and caimans that they shift through the food chain and through the feeding niches as they grow. So this is a little glimpse into that period of life for Purusaurus. Which is interesting because, because I was thinking that you, we've talked about that before, that ontogenetic niche partitioning Mm -hmm. where adults and youngs are eating different things. This is an animal where the young are eating the things that an adult caiman today would be eating. Yes. Because their parents were just ridiculously large. Yeah, because this 13-foot juvenile was not yet half-grown. Right. (laughs) Which is ridiculous. It's a fun, as we've talked about before, tooth marks are always a fun uh, example of a scientific conclusion because you pick it up and you go, hey, we now have direct evidence that a croc ate sloths. Mm -hmm. And it's tempting to go, well, yeah, did we think they didn't? But you never actually know until you have the direct evidence. And it's always a fun, you start to get into a situation uh, and in some sites you can do this where you can actually build ancient food webs based on direct evidence of we have evidence that this animal ate this other animal and we can construct a little bit of a food web mm-hmm. based on what we have. And speaking of like confirming things we already suspected, uh, Prusaurus has been listed as likely having one of the strongest bites of any animal ever mm-hmm. for a long time just by metricing up just just by being big and being a croc yes by taking measurements from today's crocs and scaling it up because it as far as we can tell the bigger the croc gets the stronger their bite gets and today the saltwater crocodile the estuarian crocodile maxes out with the strongest bite at not quite two tons purusaurus likely had a bite somewhere around four times that and this bone this leg bone supports that ridiculous bite, because some of the sections of bone were collapsed. Ooh. Not just indented by teeth, but crushed. Wow. Yeah, it was a big bite. (laughs) Very cool. Well, speaking of younger versions of really big things, my next bit of news is about an embryonic dinosaur. Cool. Specifically, the super tiny remains of a sauropod dinosaur, long necks, long tails, uh, big pillar leg, little foot characters, Which tells us some very surprising things about what baby sauropods may have looked like. All right. Some very surprising things. If they were bipedal. Stay tuned. No, well, (laughs) it's just a skull. So I can't say if you're wrong. (laughs) This is research by Martin Kondrat et al. in the journal Current Biology. And we'll link to an article in Reuters by Will Dunham. The specimen in question was found inside a partial eggshell from Argentina, late Cretaceous. So we're somewhere around 100 million years ago or thereabouts. A famous place and time for these sauropods. Yes, it is. This is where we get some of the largest sauropods ever. Yeah, largest land animals of all time. Yep. Which were uh, sauropods specifically of the group Titanosauria, the titanosaurs. Aptly named. Which is what this is. Yay! This, uh, the, the eggshell was filled with sediment and a skull. No body, just a skull. Okay. Which is the opposite of what we usually get for sauropods. that's weird. Yep. The skull is about three centimeters long. In the egg appears to be an embryo of a titanosaur sauropod. Paleontologists were able to prep the left side of the skull, so clean it off, get the sediment away from it and everything, and then scan the whole thing to get an internal and right side image of it. It's a cool time to do paleontology. Right. And what they found, right off the bat, they have a nearly complete skull here. Which, like I said, rare for sauropods. That makes this one of the best titanosaur skulls we have. (laughs) And it's an (laughs) embryo skull. Based on the degree of mineralization in the bone, which is to say how much the bone had formed and hardened into its sort of final forms, the researchers estimate, comparing it to croc and bird development, that it was probably about four-fifths or 80% of the way through development. All right. So it wasn't too far off from hatching when so it was fossilized. Not quite a newborn, but very close to what a newborn would look like. Yes, yeah, exactly. This was just about ready to come out of the egg. Cool. And among the features that it had in its skull, some of them were very much like the adults. They were able to identify it as a titanosaur based on a number of different features. That Okay, yeah, this is a titanosaur skull. 
but there are a few differences. Some of the differences are very specific, like the shape of the nostrils and stuff, but there are two that really stand out. The first is that the the little almost baby had forward-facing eyes. Oh. To a significant degree more than the adults do, which means it would have had stereoscopic or binocular vision, meaning that the, the view field of the two eyes overlapped a bunch, which gives you great depth perception in front of you. Allows you to triangulate and target things more easily. Which suggests that babies of at least this species and possibly titanosaurs and possibly sauropods were born with forward-facing eyes. And then as they grew up, the eyes shifted to be more sideways facing. Weird. Very unusual and unexpected. Yeah. Which which seems to suggest that babies were visually doing things different from the mm-hmm. adults. Because we see uh, today a lot of herbivores, a lot of animals that are common prey, have sideways facing vision because it helps you look around you more effectively. Yeah, you, you, some people may have heard the the phrase eyes up front on the hunt, eyes on the side, ready to hide. Right. And it's, yeah, typically things with eyes facing sideways, it lets you look for danger more easily. While eyes up front means you're pursuing things. Right, you're a, you have a targeting system. Yes, exactly. Now, you also see binocular vision in groups like primates. Yep, a lot of arboreal groups. A lot of arboreal groups where having better depth perception might help you navigate the trees. And it raises the question, did these babies need binocular vision for some reason? Yeah. And I, I, the authors, I, as far as I could tell reading through the paper, didn't suggest a specific reason for it. Like a behavioral. Thing. Right. In my mind, I got, the first thing that came to my mind is if you're surrounded by adults, you don't need to look for danger. Yes. That's a good point. Assuming that they are actually living with their parents, which we don't know. As young. Right. Then maybe you don't need to look, and you look, looking straight ahead is beneficial for finding the best plants or whatever. Mm-hmm. But who knows? I want, like, the first idea I had is, is, were they eating something different? Like, would babies be snapping up insects and, like, building up protein before that they can... Uh, true. ...just switch over to an all-plant diet? That, that certainly could be. Yeah. Mm, they were arboreal. Yes, that's, That must that's be it. They were the climbing trees. The only other option. <laughs> the other strange feature that they noticed was part of the premaxilla. So in dinosaurs and a lot of other animals... The upper jaw, there is a pair of small bones up at the front that are the premaxillary bones. They often have teeth on them. Mm-hmm. It's just part of the bone complex of the jaw. In this embryo, the front of the premaxillary bones projected forward into a spike, which the authors suggested in life was likely covered in some sort of tissue like keratin or something, mm-hmm. making it a forward pointing horn. This baby titanosaur, maybe titanosaurs in general, maybe sauropods, <laughs> was born with a horn on its nose. A little forward projecting point yeah, built into the bone of its face, which is even weirder than the binocular vision. Well, then now we have why they had binocular vision. How else are you going to aim at stuff and stab it with right. your horn? They had face? to spear dragonflies out of the sky so that yeah. they could eat them. It's just their neck striking like a scorpion. <laughs> now, uh, some of our listeners might be saying, oh, but that makes me think, since it is in the egg, mm-hmm. of an egg tooth. Yes. And now, an egg tooth is a, sp- a specific tooth that is grown on the outside of a snout of certain animals. Birds get it. Uh, I think a lot of turtles get yep. it. That they will use to break out of the egg. Mm-hmm. Like it, it, They use it like a little chisel to yep. pop that shell, and then they can start pushing their way out. But an egg tooth is a tooth. Mm-hmm. It's made of dentin and enamel. Episode 88, it's built of tooth stuff. And then they shed it. And then it's lost. Yes. A horn like this <laughs> is built into the bone of the face. This isn't something that would have gone away. The authors suggested that it could maybe have been used up in place of an egg tooth or alongside an egg tooth. That mm-hmm. made, This animal could also have had an egg tooth in addition to this. But... It also had a horn. Mm-hmm. And when it was born, it meant that this baby sauropod had a little spike on the front of its face. Yeah. For reasons unknown. I love stuff like this with sauropods because, and I feel like we've mentioned this, but maybe we haven't. Sauropods are such a you know, generic dinosaur. 
you know, they're, they're treated, it's standard, you know. Yeah. It's a, the brontosaur. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, we have our big meat eater, our triceratops, our stegosaurus, and a, you know, a sauropod. Yeah, it's standard. So it's easy to forget, and I don't hear it talked about often, how super bizarrely strange sauropods are. So weird. They're so... You have this ridiculous neck, this ridiculous tail. You are massive. Enormous. That we actually can't agree on the physics of how you moved or fed yourself. And so when we get extra stuff, like also they may have been born with horns. Of course they were. Of course. Sauropods. Yes. Why it, not? <laughs> also, I just thought of another thing. Maybe, I didn't think of this before, maybe the little horn wasn't for breaking its own egg. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that was that different diet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They would go around. This is why they had that binocular vision. They're searching for eggs. Yes. And they <laughs> and slurp up the stuff inside. <laughs> okay, was, maybe it was the competitive uh, uh, siblings thing that some birds do. Oh, I yeah. I hatched first, and then I just yeah. puncture Pe all of the other eggs in yeah. the nest. Break all the other eggs. I am the only baby now. Oh, they're like uh, uh, tiger sharks. <laughs> That's <laughs> uh, like only one person is going to be in this nest. <laughs> uh, last note, uh, the species of this titanosaur is not known mm -hmm. for a couple of reasons. One, uh, it's different from other known sauropods. It's different from other known sauropod embryos from Argentina. Oh, that's interesting. So it, it seems to be something different. But number one, episode 33, really hard to tell... Uh, which babies go with which adults. Well, yeah, it'd be like the, taking a juvenile, you know, even of a fairly small group, like a juvenile primate, and be like, yeah, which one does this match? I don't which know. Which monkey is this baby? None of them have alien heads. They look super weird. <laughs> the other reason that the authors are not sure what species it might be is because we don't know where it came from. Oh. This specimen was illegally exported out of Argentina uh, some time ago before being brought to the researchers, and when that happens... You don't have the information of where it was found or when it was found or who found it or any of that kind of stuff. Oh. S based on what it is and the fact that it's from Argentina, late Cretaceous is the reasonable uh, estimate for its age. But beyond that, we don't know. It has since been re uh, rehoused at the Carmen Funes Municipal Museum in Argentina. So it is back home Yay. where researchers can study it. But... Yeah, we've lost a bunch of that information. However, the authors point out in their paper that there's lots of other embryos in Argentina. Uh, or at least there's other eggs, and there are other embryos known yes. for sauropods. So hopefully, there will be more of these to find. Awesome. Eggs. That is back where it should be, and that's a super cool egg. Very cool study. Wow. Paleoartists. Oh, I, I oh it is. Oh. <laughs> Listeners, uh, like, as always... Blog post will include links to the popular articles that we're we're referencing here. Check it out. There's some cool figures from this paper. Yes, I need all yeah. of the pictures of, of little horned baby sauropods. <laughs> I, I need Weird. you to redraw Littlefoot <laughs> <laughs> with accurately with just dead forward facing eyes and a horn. Oh man, that fight with Sarah would have gone way <laughs> different. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of dinosaurs. My next bit of news is about a new technique of statistical analysis to try to identify sexual dimorphism in dinosaurs. Yeah, we talked about sexual selection in episode 63, looking at how different uh, uh, sexes, males versus females, will evolve different features. Yes, and so sexual dimorphism is when you have distinct trends between the two sexes of a species, and it has been routinely very difficult to identify in dinosaurs. And this study took a different route to try to identify it than is usually used. This is research by Evan Saita et al. in the Biological Journal of the Linnaean Society. And the press release is by the Field Museum and phys.org. Also, we should make a note. Uh, we don't say this uh, all the time, but I saw a discussion of it online not too long ago, and it makes me think that we should remind people Press releases are advertisements for papers released by the institutions yes. responsible for the paper, as opposed to a journalistic article, uh, which is written from a more outside perspective, 
Just a thing to keep in mind. Press releases aren't journalism. Yeah, like the J- journals... J- just to know the difference between uh, what they are. The articles typically will include quotes from people outside the study to get another perspective and things mm-hmm. like that. Well, the press release, it can often be written by people in the institution or even one of the researchers and stuff. Right. The press so. release is for journalists to then do more digging. Yes. So just keep that in mind when you read press releases. That's not... It doesn't mean they're bad, but... No. It does mean that they it may means not that be... It, they're not impartial. They're not impartial. They which could is be more biased. Which is hallmark of journalism. So it's typically very hard to tell whether a dinosaur species shows sexual dimorphism because, one, you could be looking at two species. Yep. That it, if, it, it, it's not necessarily male and female. Exactly. It could be two species. You might be looking at different dinosaurs, not differences in the same dinosaur. You could be looking at age differences. Yep. Adult versus juvenile. Especially if there's a size there. If if females are typically smaller, well, are they smaller or is that just a young version of that dinosaur? Or maybe you're looking at weirdos. Like, maybe you're looking at oddities within this species that sometimes these animals develop a weird feature. Right. Or when it's particularly harsh that year, that the winter was real harsh, their horns don't develop the same way or something like that. And so, unless you find a dinosaur with, like, egg-bound... Yeah, pregnant. ...that is definitely a female dinosaur, it's really hard to, for sure, identify sexual dimorphism. Dinosaurs did not do do us the courtesy of having a baculum, uh, as we discussed in episode 53. That's a mammalian trait. (laughs) Darn cloacas. Now... We expect to find it. It makes sense to find it because both birds and crocodilians, the two closest relatives today of dinosaurs, show vast dim- sexual dimorphism. Yes. Like, that is a very common thing in both of those groups, and it's, like, aggressive in some of them. So it would make sense if dinosaurs showed it. But many studies that try to identify this... Uh, Many studies that try to identify this are using statistics. They're looking at a group of fossils, specimens, taking measurements, taking measurements, and then running a statistical analysis to say, do you notice consistent differences between these specimens that might indicate sexual dimorphism? Right. Computer, group these. And if there's two distinct groups, maybe we're getting sexual dimorphism. Exactly. And that's the usual technique. This is called significance testing. You're looking for it to group out in significant, you know, like in distinct groupings. But the issue the researchers point out with this technique for this purpose is that typically our sample sizes are not large and sexual dimorphic traits may be very subtle. Yep. And if you're dealing with small numbers, those statistical techniques are looking for obvious differences. Otherwise, they may ignore the slight differences and not make distinct groups. Right. That you're telling the computer to group and it's going to group. Yes. So it might be picking up on random or unrelated features because your sexual dimorphism is more subtle than the arbitrary differences yeah. it's finding. Or it may just end up grouping it all into one because it says, no, I didn't see any. Yep. Here, I, They're randomly scattered. This experiment did the same thing. It Lots of specimens, lots of measurements, ran a statistical analysis, but they're using a slightly different analysis. This is called effect size statistics. And this is better for smaller data sets. And what it does is it tries to estimate the degree of difference and then calculate the uncertainty of that estimate of that estimate. <coughs> and so what that means is it will try to group out based on sexual dimorphism, because that's what they're running this test for, and then it will add error bars. You know, this is how much error is associated with this estimate. This is how much error is associated with this estimate. And error in statistics means uncertainty. Like, we're estimating X, but it could be as high as Z or as low as W. Exactly. Within our range of uncertainty. And this allows them to identify more subtle trends and identify the presence of sexual dimorphism potentially much more accurately. Ooh. One of the co-authors, Max Stockdale, actually wrote the code that ran their statistical analysis. Cool. They uploaded measurements from dinosaur fossils and yielded estimates for body mass dimorphism, so looking for consistent sizing differences. 
da, da, da. and they did find evidence for sexual dimorphism in some groups. Myasaura, Ooh. the famous mother dinosaur, showed a significant degree of variance in size. Uh, that males and females seemed like they were almost 45% different in size between them as adults. But the kind of downside to this study is it does not identify whether it's male or female. Right. We can tell that there does seem to be sexual dimorphism, but we don't know which sex is is showing which trait. Right, which is an issue with any statistical mm-hmm. study. Is, yeah, you can't, then you have to make educated guesses. So one of the sexes of Myasaura was almost half again as big as the other, but who knows which one that was. <laughs> yeah, male's a good guess, but not definite. Yeah. We live in, I, I think I said before when we mentioned the scanning, it's a cool time to be in paleontology. Mm-hmm. Mathematics is becoming ever more present and important in paleontology. I'll hear from people every now and then who are like, uh, can I be a paleontologist? What kind of skills uh, can I apply? Do I have to go out into the field and dig for stuff? Uh, you know, what if I this or that? And it's honestly, you can be a paleontological statistician. Yes. You know, a lot of statistical and mathematical work goes into inf- interpreting behavior, interpreting lifestyle differences, all sort. you know, it's a lot of measurements mm-hmm. in paleontology. And so the math component of it is ever, ever increasing in its importance. Absolutely. And they point out that one of the, they also point out that this is a potentially new way to bring statistics that has not widely been used. And so, and so they're hoping that this will be a, a, a in, maybe not a revolution, but a another step forward in the way we're using statistics in paleo is to bring in different statistics that look at things a different way to try to utilize the data we have the best we can. Very cool stuff. Mm-hmm. I look forward to, to some of our listeners being the people that then go forth oh, yes. and figure this stuff out. Because from everyone I've ever known that does statistics in paleo, we need more people that do statistics in paleo. <laughs> yeah, if you're an engineer, come on. Yeah, come yeah. on over. No. Well, speaking of identifying difficult to identify and surprising things in fossils, the last bit of news here is about the oldest fossil evidence of hibernation okay or a hibernation like behavior obscure i like it oh it's gonna be great we are going back older than all of our other studies uh, thus far to the early triassic with a very famous animal named lystrosaurus yeah. this is research by megan whitney and christian sador in communications biology and we'll link to a press release press release in sci news Lystrosaurus was a famous synapsid. So we talked about synapsids in episode 47. This is the group that would eventually include mammals, but at this time did not include mammals yet. Mm -hmm. Lystrosaurus is well known because after the end Permian extinction, episode 45, it was everywhere. Yes. This is one of the animals that helped us to connect the parts of Pangaea as understanding of, of continental histories. Yeah, is it, you had that over there too? Weird. But what's interesting is that Lystrosaurus was around before the Permian extinction and then became super widespread afterwards, presumably in the post-apocalyptic world with lots of opportunities about it. Yeah, it was the Triassic cockroach. Yes, <laughs> but it was the, the giant Triassic cockroach. <laughs> so Lystrosaurus was a mammal-like creature. I don't remember off the top of my head how big they were, but I want to say like boar sized. I feel like that's or right. something like that. I have bit Google Lystrosaurus and find out how big it was. Yeah. Which leads to the questions, what adaptations allowed Lystrosaurus to be so widespread and to survive an extinction event? Well, here add to that list maybe something like hibernation. Here's how they figured that out. Lystrosaurus has no teeth. It had the beak. Mhm. But it had these big upper tusks. Yeah, they're the ones with the two little tusks on either side of the, that little cute beak face. Yep. And their tusks were ever-growing, like rodent incisors or elephant tusks. I don't know that I knew that. Yeah, which means that they didn't... They, every year, they grew more and more. And they grew in circular layers of dentine. Which means if you cut a tusk down the center, you take a cross-section, you get rings. Like a tree. Mm-hmm. 
And just like you can look at a tree's rings and see how its growth patterns shifted over time in response to various effects, same thing with Lystrosaurus and its tusks. This has uh, apparently been done with things like rodents, where you can track physiological activity through the, the history of tooth growth. Awesome. In this study, they specifically were comparing Lystrosaurus from two different places. South Africa, they looked at four specimens from South Africa, which was in lower latitudes. I don't know if it was tropical, but it was, you know, closer to the center of the planet. Mm -hmm. And then six specimens from Antarctica, which was polar at the time. Yes. So high latitude. It wasn't frozen like it is today, episode 11, but it was still Antarctica. It was still on the poles. It still got a whole lot of nighttime. So during the early Triassic, Antarctica was a place where you could live much more readily than you can today. It was habitable, but you had these long polar nights and you had this extreme seasonality. Yeah, it's still weird. Still very weird. The tusk growth of Lystrosaurus showed that the rings uh, in the tusks were fairly consistent, regular growth year after year in South Africa. Uh -huh. In Antarctica... The growth seen in the tusks was regularly interrupted. So what you'll get is these uh, uh, periods of arrested growth, which means that your the space between your lines will become very, very short. Yes. Which means you weren't getting a lot of growth, which suggests that something was interrupting your metabolic activity. Your body wasn't functioning normally mm -hmm. for a period of time. Yeah, you, could, you either weren't growing much or you weren't able to spare the resources to grow that enough. Exactly. And since this was regularly occurring, it doesn't seem like it was, you know, a, a bad drought one year. This was something happening over and over and over again. Yeah, cyclical. And they suspect that it was seasonal. And if it was seasonal, then what we might be looking at here is evidence of hibernation. Yes. That when winter came, or in a, in the case, in this case, when night fell, yes. <laughs> like when the when winter and it got super dark and probably all the plants didn't do very well, they would go into some form of lowered metabolism. Mm -hmm. Now, in the paper, they specifically mentioned torpor, yes, which is not necessarily hibernation, but a short-term reduction in your metabolism, where basically you kind of functionally go into sleep mode. Yeah. Uh, so that you're not wasting resources when there aren't a lot of resources to replenish out there. This is used by tons of animals today to survive seasonal changes. Yeah, we see this in bears. We see mm -hmm. this in... I, there are even reptiles that'll do their version, which is yeah. often called brumation. Yeah. This is where you get, like, a red-eared slider turtles that'll just sit at the bottom of a lake for three months. Or the, the famous video that came out not too long ago of all the gators frozen in the lake. Yep. This marks the oldest evidence of torpor in the fossil record. Early Triassic, near 250 million years ago. It is evidence of a couple of things. One, that Lystrosaurus, as a genus, was very flexible. Mm -hmm. That those living in South Africa and those living in Antarctica had adapted different lifestyles to deal with the different conditions that they were having to put up with. And that... At least some of them did have the ability to kind of wait out harsher times, which not only explains why they were so widespread, mm -hmm. but maybe, I stress maybe, because this, this one's a harder sell. This is very hypothetical. Maybe being geographically flexible helps you survive a mass extinction event. Yes. That if you can handle dealing with limited resources then the extinction, you might have a better chance of being spared. Yeah, when everything gets thrown into chaos, if you can wait it out through some of those chaotic moments, that might allow you to bounce back after. Yeah. And if you can go somewhere else. Yes. You know, if it's like, hey, everything's terrible in South Africa right now because the extinction event happened, but if you go, if you're farther south, it's fine if you can handle half a year of darkness. Mm -hmm. It's like, all right, well, if you can, then you're going to do okay in that ecosystem. Yep. The other thing that they point out is that the pattern of growth and changing that they see in these tusks is something that we tend to see in endotherms. Uh, Animals that are, quote, warm-blooded. Yes. Animals that have a greater degree of control over their body temperature, which piles on to a whole bunch of 
building evidence that some of these pre-mammal synapsids, these proto-mammals, if you will, had already acquired a lot of the traits we see in warm-blooded endothermic animals today. Absolutely. Which is just, it's a, it, I, this is one of those, we've talked about this before. We, episode 61 was all about behavior in the fossil mm -hmm. record. We've talked about how there are certain things about ancient animals that you just kind of shrug and go, I don't know if we will ever know that. Yep. Did ancient animals hibernate? I, to, to, yeah. If you had, had asked me, you know, how will we ever, f how could we find that out? I would go, I don't know that we could. Yeah. Maybe we can't. Because, like, I, even if you found one that was fossilized during hibernation, how would you not just go, oh, wow, it was sleeping? Right. Oh, like, well, look, it, it crawled into this cave and died. Yeah, it was curled up in a, like, you know, sleeping <laughs> position, but maybe it was just hiding. I don't know. And it, it really just goes to show how much of paleontology is rooted in a thorough understanding of modern animals. Yes. And plants and bacteria and so on. Modern life, if we... We only knew to look for this by knowing that this happens in animals today. You cannot understand one without the other. Like yep. that, the present, as as is so often said in geology, is the key to the past. Yes. So that's some really cool stuff. Hey, speaking of really cool things, yeah. And speaking of scientists who do really cool research, yeah. And speaking of ancient extinction events, uh -huh. this episode is not about Lystrosaurus or Crocs or dinosaurs. It's about the Carboniferous Rainforest Collapse. Which is also pretty neat. Also pretty neat. So what do you say? We take a short break, rejoin our friend Dr. Ali Baumgartner, and get started talking about our feature presentation. This episode's featured extinction topic is the Carboniferous Rainforest Collapse, which, as the name implies, was a big deal thing that happened in the Carboniferous. So before we actually get into the event itself, Allie, would you mind to g give us a reminder of what was the Carboniferous like? Set the stage before the extinction. What is this time period like? All right. I have a not-so-secret soft spot for the Carboniferous because, like... If you're a plant, Carboniferous, I mean, up until this point, uh, is a great <laughs> time to live. So That's where it's at. Oh, for sure. In my notes, I literally say, um, plants are thriving. <laughs> 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 They're not very helpful notes in that respect, but plants were thriving. So b before we get to that, so... Right, let's start in the big picture. The big picture. What, what, what's the earth look like? Okay, so the Carboniferous... That's what it's called in most of the world. So in the United States, we also break it down into the Mississippi and, and Pennsylvania. So I might be using all of those terms. So broadly speaking, the Carboniferous is between 358 to 298-ish million years ago. So it's about 60 million years long. The beginning of the Carboniferous is the Mississippian, so from about 358 to about 323 million years ago, and then the Pennsylvanian is from about 323 to about uh, 298 million years ago. So a lot of the cool times for plants are mostly in the Mississippian, like, early Pennsylvanian, and then by the end of the Pennsylvanian, just a lot of bad stuff happens. But, so in the early Carboniferous... <laughs> You have multiple land masses. So in the southern hemisphere, um, basically all around the, the southern pole, you have Gondwana, which, fun fact, is my favorite continent. It is the southern continent. It's good continent. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's like, if I had to pick one, it is 100% Gondwana. <laughs> 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 It, so it was the largest of the uh, continents at the time. For portions of the Carboniferous, it was glaciated. So there were some glaciations at the beginning of the Carboniferous that were kind of a holdover from the Devonian. And then when you get into the middle and end of the Carboniferous, there are periodic glaciations. Weird stuff. We'll get there. So there are smaller land masses in the northern hemisphere and in the equator. Um, and these are eventually going to combine, but we're not there yet. So because we have these multiple small land masses in the northern hemisphere, 
We have lots of really nice shallow seas. Like again, so I told you it was a good good time to be a plant. It was also a good time to be a marine invertebrate. So we have these yep. really <laughs> nice shallow seas. And then as we go through the Carboniferous, these the northern hemisphere uh, continents collide until eventually you have, I believe that is actually Laurentia when you have that. And eventually we combine into, by the end of the Carboniferous, everybody's connected and we have Pangaea. Very exciting. That means that there's a lot going on in terms of the ocean. I know, like, we're going to get to the plants, I promise, but there's a lot going on in the ocean. <laughs> so at the beginning of the Carboniferous, we have an increase in sea level, which is part of the reason why we have all of these ocean continents and all of these inland seas and why it's a great time to be a marine invertebrate. But as the Carboniferous goes on, you have a drop in sea level. So you lose these seas and there's a great decrease in the shallow marine water. And then as you... As the continents come together, you have even less. So by the end of the Carboniferous, you have two oceans. You have Panthalassa, which is just a honking huge ocean. It's literally half of the world. Like, it's the ocean equivalent of Pangaea. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yes, it's yes. All the, all, Panthalassa, all the oceans. Yes, all of it. So it's sometimes called uh, the Paleo... Uh, Pacific or the Proto-Pacific, but because the the Pacific eventually forms from Panthalassa, but that doesn't do it justice. Like you think the Pacific is a big ocean, like that's got nothing on Panthalassa. <laughs> this um, is like a Star Wars planet. Yeah, it's an exactly. ocean planet. <laughs> yes, with a single island. Like it's Star <laughs> Wars for sure. And then, and then, kind of in the like encased by Pangaea, you have the Paleotethys, and the Paleotethys sounds amazing so it's shallow it's equatorial like you get some nice limestone again if you like if you're a marine invertebrate that's where i would want to live so that's kind of the the landscape you have basically half land half water kind of in an o shape of of land and then literally the rest of the planet is just water <laughs> <laughs> just Camino. It's one of the that I was gonna That's say. It. I was gonna be like, wasn't Camino the ocean planet? Yes. <laughs> or Mon Calamar for everyone else who's a fan of them. Sure, sure, sure. Um, so we. Uh, <laughs> so we've got the Carboniferous is one of those Paleozoic time periods where the world doesn't look like the world. Yeah. In terms of its general shape, like a Star Wars planet. But uh, this is late Paleozoic, so we are abundant with life. Now, I know that the reason we invite you onto this podcast is to talk about plants. But just for a bit, mm -hmm. can you tell us what the animals were doing? So I have recently been called a um, paleontology triple threat because <laughs> I started as a vertebrate paleontologist I have taught invertebrate paleontology, and I identify as a paleobotanist. So, like, I got you, dude. Like, we, we can talk about animals. <laughs> awesome. No, that's great. We don't have to do anything this episode. Yeah, no, no, you're I'm going to take a nap. <laughs> but, so before we get to the animals, I'm going to, again, set the stage. So we, I talked about what the ocean looks like. I've talked about what the land looks like. But we have to talk about the climate because, like, oh, sure, sure. that controls everything, right? So the early Carboniferous, it was hot. So the average temperature, mean annual temperature, was about 20 degrees Celsius, which is, what, roughly 68 Fahrenheit. So, like, that's the average temperature. That's pretty hot. And then it, it's pretty tropical. So looking at the looking at the trees, you don't really see any, like, growth rings. So it looks like there's probably not much seasonality. It's just, like, tropical forests today. You know, not much seasonality, just hot and wet and great for plants. But then as you go through the carbon, the middle Carboniferous is when just everything happens. So that's when you have this cooling event. So you still have um, high oxygen and low CO2 levels, but you have this cooling down to, I think the lowest point was about 12 degrees Celsius, which I think is roughly 54 degrees Fahrenheit. Again, like this is a dramatic frigid. change. It's frigid, right? <laughs> yeah. It's a dramatic change. And then as you 
as the temperatures cool, they also dry. You have increased glaciation. That ends up sucking up a bunch of seawater. And so you have a drop in, or you have, you, you have a, 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 yeah, a drop, a change of sea level. So like everything in the late Carboniferous is the, 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 the uh, rainforest collapse. That's just what my notes say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So then we'll talk about the life. So I am, I have briefly, like the last time I was here, I mentioned the, the animals that were living in the forest. So I'm actually going to start with the marine life because sure. I do like me some marine invertebrates. They're okay. I, they're, they're pretty neat. They're pretty neat. <laughs> So I, I tease, I tease that marine invertebrates. <laughs> we did a whole episode about marine. We did two whole episodes about marine we invertebrates. Have. Plural episodes. How about that? Episodes 16 and 83. I love that <laughs> so much. <laughs> so the Paleozoic oceans are kind of weird. So it's once you get to the Mesozoic oceans, ba- basically you have mostly groups that you're familiar with. You got some weird stuff. You got mosasaurs and whatever. But in the Paleozoic, it's just so strange. So there were no more armored fish by the uh, Carboniferous, which is kind of sad. I am a big fan of armored fish, but... No, that that is a loss. That is a loss. They're so cool. But you have groups that aren't around today. So you have trilobites, rugose, and tabulate coral. Woo! That I know, right? They're so cool. Now, I should, I should interject. Trilobites is one of those marine invertebrate episodes that I, I was just referring to. Episode 82. 82. <gasps> yep. I realized after I said it. Episode 82. I forgive you. There we go. We can show we can show cracks in the armor. Yeah, it's it's episode ninety five. Eighty three with coelacanths. Oh, also cool. Yeah. So not invertebrates. So, so trilobites are present, but they're fairly rare by this point. But there are corals all over. So you have lots of filter feeders because these again these are really rich shallow seas that we're primarily talking about. Um, so you have filter free filter feeding bryozoans. Um, these really pretty fan um, morphs of bryozoans. Like, they're really pretty fossils. They look like Chex cereal. <laughs> yeah. Yep, yep, yep. That's what they remind me of. That is a really good way to describe them, yeah. Specifically wheat Chex, because they have, like, the smaller <laughs> strands. Mm-hmm. They look like wheat Chex, <laughs> um, in case you were wondering. There were also brachiopods, which are also filter filter feeders. Cryonoids which are also filter feeders. And then there are, that you're getting a bunch of uh, foraminifera. And like I said, trilobites were relatively rare. So that's the composition during the early Carboniferous. So as you move into the middle Carboniferous, again, you have this drying and you lose, um, the sea levels drop and you lose these shallow seeds. And in addition to that, you also have increased runoff from the continent. So you have increased erosion, increased runoff. So the, the, the seas are not as pristine and clear and that's no good for filter feeders. Yeah. So the, the corals, the crinoids, the bryozoans did not do so hot in the middle Carboniferous, but you do have an increase in gastropods, bony fish and sharks, which are basically eating all of those friends. Woo! <laughs> yeah. So another thing that I don't know how I didn't realize this, because I was going through um, famous uh, Carboniferous fossil sites. How did I not realize that Tully Monster was from the Carboniferous? Mm -hmm. I don't know how. Oh, right. Yeah. It's also, I also didn't realize that it was from Maison Creek, because I think of Maison Creek, Illinois, as being a floral site because it is it is famous for its fossil plants there are also apparently marine things there that was not my priority but yeah so by and large you have a lot of fluctuations but there is minor extinction events during the middle carboniferous when you do have this drop in sea level and bad things happen to filter feeders it's especially bad for crinoids and ammonites but by and large it's still a decent time to be a marine invertebrate Things are generally going better for the terrestrial, <laughs> the terrestrial things. And I feel like most people have a pretty good sense of what was going on on land during the Carboniferous. Cause you always have those really like evocative paintings of like Meganura, the dragonfly, like going through the, the forest. Uh, I also didn't realize how small Meganura was. It's like, 28 inches or 60 centimeters or whatever it was it's like oh i was thinking like 
me sized and it's not <laughs> yeah yeah person yeah. size they're they're big fur a bug yes, yes. the wing i think the wingspan yeah it's like the length of an arm yeah yeah which is which is a huge, huge dragonfly. dragonfly thing that's huge but no they're not like picking up cats yeah no that's, well, that's and that's always been how i envisioned them like people flying through the air like, yeah <laughs> well it gets it gets mixed up with the fact that then there are like w- walking Right. Arthropods. Arthropleura, the big Arth- millipede. Yes. That is six feet long. Yes. Yeah. Which is human size. That- and I think there was also it's a, like, not then- a true spider, but a cousin of a spider that was like cat sized. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> I did not write down the name, but yes, that's exactly. So yep. like, these things are legitimately big, but they're not as big, I think, as some of our imaginations have led us to believe. And for no other reason than we don't really have a sense of scale. Because, like, yeah. I don't know how big Calamites right. is. That's a point. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's a great time. So you have these big old bugs flying through the air and going through the undergrowth. So I've talked, I talked about a lot of this when I was talking about trees, when I talked about the Carboniferous before. But yeah, so this, the Carboniferous, because this is when you get the first real forest, real trees, this is also when you have the first arthropods that are prepared to break down this material. So part of the reason you have all of this coal from the Carboniferous is because the organisms are just like, I don't know what to do with cellulose. And <laughs> yep. eventually someone had to figure it out. It's just they took their first bite and were like, ew, gross. Ugh, leave it. <laughs> Accurate. Leave it there to fossilize. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, but yeah, there the one of the really cool things that did happen though during the Carboniferous is that's when you have the evidence for the origin of the amniote egg, and that's when the uh, that's when the vertebrates got their act together and figured out yeah. how to live on land. Finally, and then the plants had already got it all together, so you know the vertebrates figured out eventually. It is really funny though when you compare the, like the adaptations, like. The things the plants had to do to live on land and the things that the uh, animals had to do and live on land are basically the same. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little capsule to keep your babies yeah. in. Yeah. Bring some of the water with you yeah. and <laughs> put it in a container. Yeah. Go. So in the Carboniferous, we've got not only a lot of these newfangled land dwelling amphibian type things, you know, your your temnospondyl like kind of croc salamander shaped things. But also the the beginnings of what would eventually give rise to reptiles and then later mammals, uh, uh, etc. Animals on land actually moving out into land to explore these cool new forests that we got. Yeah. So let's talk about the forests. So let's talk. Go ahead. Carboniferous plants. Uh, the things that the that the the period is literally named for. So I'm going the to carbonaceous deposits of plants. I'm going to read verbatim from my notes. Plants were living their best life in the early Carboniferous. <laughs> Warm and wet and high CO2 meant that plants could thrive. All caps. Okay. So, <laughs> and th- this is true. So, it is warm. It is wet. There is high CO2. That means that it is easy for plants to photosynthesize. They don't have to worry about losing water. The only downside is that it's also high oxygen, which means that they might be on fire. Yeah. I mean, you know, what is no risk, no reward. Because we're those animals aren't the only ones breathing oxygen. <laughs> but I, I, I know I'm I know I mentioned this in the last episode that I talked about the trees and the carboniferous, but I I mean it. It's really cool. Uh, One of the ways that researchers in Ireland tested whether or not the the oxygen levels were high enough uh, in the Carboniferous for spontaneous combustion, they had these pressurized growth chambers that were full of oxygen, and they would walk in with a match just to see (laughs) if it lit on fire, which seems so dangerous, but science it's real cool. Science. It seems like that's that's when that's when you get the engineering department to build a robot to go yes. in with the match. Right. Yes. They had to jump This is our spontaneous combustion combustion robot. Yeah, right. <laughs> this, is, this is our this is our spontaneous combustion. We call them, this is this is spawn combat. <laughs> oh, I love it. Uh, but yeah, so also I did talk over your intern joke, which was very funny. <laughs> Continue. Uh, okay. So uh, yeah, so through the early Carboniferous 
it's a great time to be a plant. So remember, we have these islands, basically these tropical islands. It's warm, it's wet. So you have these plants that are in these pretty ideal habitats. So you have trees. So it's dominated by things like Lepidodendron, which uh, is a scale tree. You have Calamites found along waterways. So Calamites is related to modern equisetum or horsetails. They are huge. And then you have tree ferns and things like that. So it's mostly Lepidodendron. They're preserved in these things called coal balls, which coal balls are the weirdest thing because to be honest, we don't know how they form, but they did. And basically you have these concretions. They had too much calcite in them to form actual coal. And they're just full. It's basically leaf litter. And so I got to work with thin sections. You basically peel off a, like, it's it's like plastic wrap and you're like oh yeah that's bits and bits of fossil plant it's absolutely amazing there's a lot of wood in there you'll find seeds and pollen and it's amazing but yeah so you have these basically tropical islands and then as the land masses come together so you have that basically your 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 sea level is dropping your land masses are coming together and so you're having more and more continental interior and that's when things happen. Because if you think about, say, North America, the east coast of the U.S., all those trees, pretty wet. West coast, you have literal rainforest. Like, it's pretty wet. The middle of the continent is grasslands because it is dry. And so that's what happens in the middle of a continent. You, The clouds basically cannot continue to carry that water over an entire continent worth of land and so as your landmass gets bigger you're going to have dry parts and you know what doesn't work in a dry area a swamp <laughs> so <laughs> about 300 million years ago so during the pennsylvanian things changed so again you have this increased land mass so you have these dry continental interiors you have a decrease in temperature and decrease in precipitation and the forests don't know what to do. I'm anthropomorphizing them, but they, I, in my head, they're panicking. <laughs> yeah, they're freaking out. They are freaking out. So they're basically clustered together into groups, like you have every plant for himself. And so these forests become fragmented. And that's bad. <laughs> because before that, basically all of the animal uh, groups were cosmopolitan. But once you have this fragmentation you have a lot of more endemism. So you have these animal groups that are isolated to these small pockets of land. And the same thing with plants. Plants don't move. They basically yeah. move once a generation. That's it. So they can't really escape things very quickly. So as they were isolated into these pockets and it got drier and drier and drier, they basically had nowhere to go and they were fundamentally gone. So there were still forests event like afterwards, but not at all the same. And so there were there was a pattern. We figured out what happened. I say this like we know, but we're learning. <laughs> so basically, I mentioned this before when I talked about trees. Man, I like past me did a great setup for this episode. <laughs> yeah. That was episode seventy three. Everybody go listen. It's, it's true. <laughs> I'm looking at. I'm also looking at my notes from that episode. I'm like, man, I talked a lot about this already. <laughs> So the, the Carboniferous forests fundamentally changed the hydrology. Like I remember people getting really excited about this because me too. So we didn't have rivers in the same sort of way after the, the trees happened. The forests changed the hydrology, so they increased floodplain stability. So basically there was less, eros uh, less erosion and less movement of the rivers because there was increased forest density, woody debris, like literal log jams, and then complex roots holding everything in place. So there are multiple stages of the collapse. So it started off by a rise in opportunistic ferns. Basically, ferns were like, oh, things are happening. Like, you know, there's an opportunity here. I'm going to grow. So this is something that we see in... So ferns are a classic example of an opportunistic mm -hmm. group of plants. I remember the first time that I heard about that was in relation to the end Cretaceous mass extinction, mm -hmm. episode five with uh, what was termed the fern spike. Yep. Is that when things went bad, 
and there was all this space that was uh, opened up for plants to move in and take over. Ferns uh, were the first ones to sort of colonize and take over these opportunities. Oh, for sure. And for a variety of reasons, it works really well, because in general, ferns don't tend to be woody or as woody, so they can just, like, grow now. They just appear one night. That's not quite accurate, but, you know, geologically speaking. <laughs> well, it's the it's the weed way of life of, I, I'm not growing giant, and I'm not lasting for years and years, but I grow quickly, and I grow everywhere. Live fast, I so, love. So... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you can't get rid of me because by the time you've killed that one, I've already propagated over here. So let's, uh, to set the stage of what you're getting into, we've had this time period, the Carboniferous, which is great for plants, big forests, uh, trees are living their best life, plants in general live in their best life. The rainforest collapse, this event uh, toward the end of the period, is happening later Pennsylvanian, and you're so multiple stages of an event. You know, we think about extinction events as being a doom, doom, and now, now it's done. KPG. <laughs> yes. Right. <laughs> exactly. So uh, to continue what you were going on, what? how does this start and what does the start of it look like? So basically, as you're having these trees pushed out of the interior into groups. So as you have this expansion of these dry areas, these these plants cannot handle any amount of aridity. Like I mentioned before, they because the they're adapted to a wet environment and they're also adapted to high oxygen levels, which means mm-hmm. that they are trying to not be on fire. And so <laughs> relatable, yeah, right? Oh, yeah, I've been no. doing that. I've been doing that for a long time. I sympathize. Oh, Stop, drop, and roll. I thought I would have to use that. I never have. Knock on wood. But <laughs> anyway, so you have these plants, these trees that are basically fire hoses. They are just pumping so much water through their system. But that means that if they don't have bioavailable water, like plant available water. They cannot cope. And so they are restricted, 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 restricted. And after that, you have these ferns that are basically like, well, I don't need that much water. And so after the lycopsids, so like lepidodendron, are wiped out, they you still have some forest, but instead of being dominated by lepidodendron like they were in the ar- uh, early Carboniferous, they move into being dominated by tree ferns. Again, these opportunistic ferns that were like, well, I don't need that much water. And this is supported by, there is a decrease in basically fossil log jams during the Carboniferous rainforest collapse because there really aren't trees. You can't have log jams if you don't have trees falling. Yeah, wow, that's really interesting. So you're, you're lacking in the debris that is characteristic of a forest. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned uh, that log jams were part of how the forests changed water, freshwater systems. Mm-hmm. So does that have an impact on our water uh, cycles? Yes. So there was something that I, I saw briefly. I didn't look into it too closely. But yes, there is a difference in the hydrology of Pangaea after the rainforest collapse. Because before you have all this floodplain stability, you know, there's roots and trees and log jams. And then after that goes away, you have a greater floodplain. It's able to move. You can have um, these anastomosing or anabranching. So so rivers that aren't just like meandering, they're able to kind of go every which way, which they weren't able to do uh, when there were trees in the way. Oh, interesting. Oh, uh, that's so. Is this like? Uh, and and I am trying to picture it. Do we see? Like, I'm picturing the Amazon, which is this. I picture as this long, meandering, snaking river, as opposed to maybe out on the plains? Question mark. Is that what we're talking? Like more branching patterns? So, okay. I guess an example could be. What we've done to the Mississippi River. (laughs) Gotcha. The Mississippi River does not want to go to New Orleans anymore, but we made it. So it's it's kind of that. So it's the, instead of allowing the rivers to kind of like, you know, jump their banks and like, all right, I'm flowing this way for a little while. 
they they really couldn't do that because in order to do that, you have to be able to move the sediment. You have to yep. be able to dig this channel. And if you have trees in the way, like, I guess I'm going to keep going this way then. It's Oof. just the rivers move. No, you move. No. It's stubborn. I was going to say a rock in a hard place. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so we've got these, the, the this increasing dryness. Trees are not doing great. Ferns are doing good. We're losing our logs. Rolls over your neighbor's dog. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And basically, the the forest just becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. The rainforest. There are still, you know, gymnosperms hanging out in the cooler regions. Just, you know, shaking their heads at the rainforest. But, uh, yeah. Basically, <laughs> by the end of the Carboniferous, it's... You don't really have these these huge coal swamps anymore. It's 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 not it's not happy. I I like the early Carboniferous. <laughs> like once you get to the mid Carboniferous, like if you're a plant, like it's just upsetting. You know, it's funny. I always, you know, I I think of the Carboniferous the same way. I think that you, as a geology student, you are taught to think of it as just these incredible forests and all. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, the the swaths of the planet are covered in swamps and forests and stuff but i never really sat down to consider the fact that it didn't stay that way yep and i this is one of the answers this event is one of the answers to the questions of why why yeah why isn't the world still like that because the continents conspired against (laughs) the the whole world (laughs) yeah the glaciers were in on it that's all. That is true. <laughs> that is true. But <laughs> the, the thing about it is, like, I don't know about you guys, but I, I do think of the geologic time scale kind of like Star Wars planets. Like yeah. each time bin is all one thing, and so like the Carboniferous is great for plants, and then suddenly you get to like the actual worst that is the Permian. And you don't really think about yeah. how you get there. And like the only, and, and I know, like, I obviously, I, I have heard of extinction events. I have literally listened to every episode of your podcast and I am actually a paleontologist. <laughs> so like, I know these things, <laughs> but, but even that is sort of a disconnect because it's like, you have like the Permian, you have the Permo Triassic extinction, and then you have the Triassic and these are all discrete, discrete things. And they're not <laughs> like by definition, it, it's time like it's continuous yep. well and i i think that one of the things that happens we i i think like we got this question at one point maybe in one of our q a's uh about why boundaries geologic boundaries always seem to line up with extinction events yeah right? extinction events are always the end cretaceous boundary mm-hmm. the end triassic they're never like rarely at least two-thirds of the way into the cretaceous you know in the middle of nowhere and the reason is because we named those periods we, when we named them we bookended them by dramatic changes yep and so that can that also means that when you read the geologic time scale it's easy to go well the carboniferous was like this and the permian was like this mm-hmm. and the triassic was like this because the change happened on those borders yes yes well and the other thing too in one of the papers that you sent me plants if you use the if you read the time scale using plants you get a very different picture. And that is something that I find absolutely fascinating because like, yes, plants tend to also be affected by many mass extinctions because a lot of them are driven by some sort of climate change for whatever reason and plants can't move. Yep. (laughs) Well, guess I'll die. (laughs) That's why plants are great for paleoclimate because if they can't, like... (laughs) They just die. (laughs) They're just all the musicians from Titanic. Yes. This is my life now. Yeah. I was going to say the plants are all like uh, the classic character in the disaster movie. Like the old lady in Dante's Peak Mm -hmm. who's like, I've lived here my whole life and I'll die Mm -hmm. here. And that's that's where they (laughs) stay. That's plants. 100% accurate. But yeah, so if you look at the, like, if you look at things with plants, then... The time scale is completely different because, like, you know, the 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 Cambrian, the way you look at early life is going to be a little bit different because, like, you don't really have plants 
that are marine, not mm-hmm. in the same way that there are like marine animals. And so, yeah, I don't worry about that old part of the time scale. But once plants get on land, it's very exciting. But like, this is a major plant extinction, more, more so than most of the other ones. This is major for plants. I came across a study, and maybe we, maybe we saw the same one. Maybe I maybe this is the one you're talking about. Yeah. That this was a 2013 study that did an overview of the plant fossil record, and they suggested that with based on what they were seeing, there were two major plant mass extinctions, and this is one of them. Yep. Yeah. The other one was a little later in, I think, the middle to late Permian. Yeah, because they said the Permian is the worst time to be a plant. <laughs> so the Carboniferous rainforest collapse. This isn't like uh, you. Know, I, I hear it I, when you read about it. I re- I've read it described as a minor extinction event because what they're comparing it to is all the big animal extinctions. Yeah. But this is like the end Permian for plants. Yes, it is. And that's just showing our animal bias in the fossil yep. record. <laughs> this is why you need me. But it it, it is really true because like we should be taking all of the biosphere into consideration when we're dating the earth because you can't have a without b (laughs) like if the plants are doing something weird it's probably affecting what the animals are doing but we're naming stuff usually off of one half of that oh for sure well and the the uh oh my goodness i had a brilliant thought and it's completely gone um but i agree with you (laughs) (laughs) we believe you (laughs) all right so we have this collapse of the rainforest. Our our rainforest collapse has happened here at the end of the Carboniferous, leading us into the Permian. Now, before we get into sort of the post-apocalypse part of this extinction discussion, I want to go into a little bit more discussion, a little more detail into exactly what was going on around these plants at that time, and exactly the details of why, why this happened. And we'll talk about that after this break. So I spent a lot of time talking about what the Carboniferous is and what exactly the Carboniferous Rainforest Collapse is, but I think I've talked enough. So David, can you give us a little <laughs> bit more information about this post-apocalyptic landscape that is the Permian and what may have led <laughs> to this Carboniferous Rainforest Collapse that then led to the Permian? Sure can. I So I did. I did uh, some looking into what... The, the details of the, the specific reasons, causes, changes were. And one of the first things that I came across that I thought would, was interesting to point out is that one early, not super early, the 90s, hypothesis for why the Carboniferous Collapse happened was that it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so there was a 1997 study that proposed that it was a Issue with our reading of the fossil record. Oh, was it like a, oh, yeah, yeah. This, a sampling error? A sampling error. Now, this has since been uh, discounted, but I do want to make note of it for a couple of reasons. One, because it's an interesting discussion. And two, because I came across it while I was researching. And it, sometimes it's difficult when you read a paper to know how much of the stuff that's being mentioned in that paper is still a thing that people are seriously thinking about. Mm-hmm. And because it is a absolutely legitimate concern that extinctions in the fossil record can be fake well that happens with uh when we observe stuff all the time of like well we're not finding any of uh there was there was one example i heard which was planes during world war ii planes would come back and they would have bullet holes in the wings and in the tail and like around the the body of the plane but not around the cockpit and the designers looked, uh, or someone in charge looked and went, well, we should reinforce all those parts that are getting shot up. And someone went, no, 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 no. We need to refor- reinforce the cockpit. You're only seeing the planes that are coming back. Yep. <laughs> and we get that kind of thing in the fossil record where an extinction can seem faster or shorter. We talked about this in episode nine with the Cambrian explosion. Mm-hmm. There was a lot of discussion. Was that even a thing? Yes. Was it just that now we had fossils of the stuff? <laughs> yes. The 1997 study that I saw proposed that we are we were missing information there. So they suggested evidence of a couple of a handful of major unconformities in Europe and North America. So an unconformity geology folks 
is if you have a period of time where you have a lot of sedimentation, like a swamp or a shallow ocean, you're getting a lot of buildup of sediment, then let's say that all gets uplifted and now it's all being eroded and there's not much new sediment being put down, in the geologic record, you're just not going to get any new layers there. Mm -hmm. That's an unconformity where you you have one layer that goes to the next one and you're missing like five million years or whatever in between. I When I was teaching geology classes, I would tell my students that a con an unconformity means that something changed. So if you have an unconformity, so that can be erosion where you have, you know, say you have a sandstone and then it erodes and you have another sandstone on top of it. You might not be able to tell that these are different things. Or if you have a sandstone and then you have basalt on top, something <laughs> happened. Or if you have layers that are flat and then you have la layers that are not flat and then you have layers that are flat, something happened in there. So basically, I would always tell my students, if there is an unconformity, something fundamentally changed and it's important. And this supposed missing pieces of the story came to be called Wa Wagner's Gap. I've heard of that. Which was the su suggestion that there would have there was perhaps a long period of erosion that would just removed stuff from the record that made it look like an extinction happened. But uh, since then, other studies have looked into this and found that we do appear to have a fairly continuous record of plants through this time, which suggests that there was an actual extinction, not just extinction, but what we call turnover. Mm -hmm. And turnover means that the stuff that was there before has been replaced. Yes. There has been a swap. Specifically, as Ali was uh, mentioning before, the swap had to do with the kind of climate and environment that these plants were adapted to. Mm -hmm. And the reason that the kind of environment changed is because this was a time of dramatic climate change. Specifically, as you mentioned, the late Carboniferous was a glacial period. Mm-hmm. There were big continental ice sheets on Gondwana, the southern uh, uh, continents. Best you continent. Had best, it's a cool <laughs> continent, which includes some of the lowest CO2 levels in the atmosphere that we've ever seen whew, in Earth history. And then as we move into the Permian, we come out of it. It is a case of the Earth going from what we call an ice house to a greenhouse. Yes. Ice house where we had permanent ice and then greenhouse where we didn't. And as one paper put it, a greenhouse condition that arguably lasted until two and a half million years ago when the Pleistocene Ice Age kicked in. <laughs> it's just absolutely, it's one of those things that we take for granted that there are, there's ice at the poles. And yeah. there wasn't. <laughs> there was a, there was a little <laughs> bit at the beginning that kind of like, you know, holdovers but like it's it's i want to be a time traveler i think that the carboniferous would be actually a terrifying <laughs> time to go maybe i don't want to go to the carboniferous i would need like one of those old-timey diving bells yep because like i that sounds dangerous <laughs> yeah well and it's i think this is also interesting because it's a lot of times climate shifts pair up with uh extinctions you know we've done the previous mm -hmm. episodes those usually go hand in hand. But this isn't like, ooh, sea levels got a little bit, you know, lower. Sea levels got a little bit higher. It got a little bit warmer, drier. It's like, no, no, we went from ice house to greenhouse. Yeah. Major shift. For almost for good. <laughs> like, <laughs> And along with that change came those drier conditions, reduced precipitation. Uh, also, in cr changes to seasonality. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So seasonality, would you like to describe what we mean by seasonality? I love seasonality. This I could tell. I could see it in your eyes. <laughs> uh, we paleoclimate researchers like to joke that like seasonality is the, ne the next big thing in paleoclimate. So seasonality is to have seasons. So if you think about a tropical rainforest, if you were to don't do this, you were to cut down a tree in the rainforest, you wouldn't have distinct rings because in general the tree is just growing you don't have these periods when it's not growing for whatever reason cold dry whatever temperate regions are defined by seasonality so like you know here in kansas or in tennessee or michigan or wherever you have periods where the where things don't grow 
because it's too cold and dark and terrible. So if you have increased seasonality, that can be for a variety of reasons. It can be because of change in temperature uh, or changes in precipitation. Seasonality is really cool. <laughs> and it, it, it comes to typify. I mm-hmm. mean, we, we get it. We are very familiar with it yes. because we live in high latitudes. And so, we, well, I guess mid latitudes. Yes. We're not in the we're not at the equator. Nope. So we are very accustomed to seasons, but not all biomes are adapted for that kind of fluctuation. Well, I think it's it's also easy to not realize when you live in a temperate place that just because the plants live there doesn't mean that it's good for them all year round. <laughs> like yes. these plants are having to put up with winter so that they can start growing again come right. spring and summer. Relatable. Well, yes, <laughs> it's, I'm, I like cold weather. I'm good. Uh, but while at the equator, they're just going, you know, foot on the gas and go. Yeah, it's like living in a cave. Exactly. It's yeah. just the same all the time. And it's if you like it, then it's great. Yep. One of the cool things that like kind of boggled my mind when I learned about it with respect to like tropical ecosystems, because if you think about like temperate regions, so if you think about like, you know, Temperate North America in the spring, there are flowers and like, and then in the summer, everything's making fruit. And then in the fall, everything drops their leaves. And then in the winter, they're trying not to die. And the fact that like in the tropics, there are flowers all year round. Mm -hmm. Just like, (laughs) that's so cool. They just take turns. Well, and you, now, can, you can tell uh, which countries are the ones making so many of the documentaries because they always focus on the se- the seasons. Yep. So, yeah, because Europe and North America. <laughs> well, everyone knows this. This is relatable for everyone around the world. Now, we, we've been talking a lot about, you know, you mentioned that tropical areas were hit hard because we're changing what that, that climate regime is like. But another question that always comes up whenever there's a big extinction event is the question of whether it was, did it affect everywhere the same? And for the Carboniferous Rainforest Collapse, there is this question that I've seen pop up in some of the literature of, was this really just a tropics in the northern continents thing? And there was a 2015 paper that I found that examined trends in plant dynamics and climate signals in southern South America. So on Gondwana, Best continent. which was... <laughs> at the time, we'll get, we'll get a shirt made. Yep. <laughs> at the time, high latitude. Mm-hmm. Right? This is an area in the south, but high latitude area, which presumably would already have had perhaps more degree of seasonality or something like that. And they found similar trends in not just increasing aridity, dryness, but also shifts in plant species and animal species. So this does appear to have been a global shift in climate that these changes were happening in in response to. Now, a climate shift does not have to happen for, like, a specific reason. Nope. It's always very tempting to, to look and say, oh, well, what caused that? Was it that this thing happened? Did an asteroid hit the planet? Well, like... The the gradual general changes of continental shifts and ocean currents and... Plant, forest cover, all these things can affect climate, can affect the levels of CO2 in the air. And this extinction I have seen referred several times as climate shifts as a function of carbon dioxide levels changing in the atmosphere. And that seems to have been largely the case here as well. But I, I have to point out, I think, that any time you have a major extinction event, especially a climate-related extinction event, you can bet that someone is out there writing a paper about volcanoes. Yep. I was waiting for the volcanoes, actually, because it's always volcanoes. Yep. Volcanoes. We have talked about this before. There is a phenomenon that occurs. Uh, we have mentioned this, I think, in every, at least the big five yep. uh, extinction episodes we've talked about. Throughout Earth history, we see these uh, deposits, which we call large, large igneous, igneous provinces. provinces. See, even Will has learned it. <laughs> I'm and not he, even a geologist. You, didn't even, <laughs> you haven't even done any of the extinction episodes. <laughs> large igneous provinces are provinces, regions of the planet, that are, in certain s- sections of the geologic record, covered in igneous rock. Because volcanic activity just 
flooded a whole space blah, 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 blah. over hundreds, thousands, perhaps even millions of years with ongoing eruptions. And there are uh, geologists among us who like to make the point that many slash most slash all question mark of our favorite major extinction events seem to possibly maybe line up <laughs> with various different large igneous province deposits. And that's also the case here. <laughs> Specifically, uh, the, the one that has been pointed to for this is a northern Europe site called the Skagerrak Centered Large Igneous Province. That is a fantastic name. Right? Ska uh, uh, assuming I'm pronouncing it right, which I might not be. Northern Europeans, let me know. <laughs> this province covers roughly 250,000 square kilometers. Oh my god. Which, if go back to like episode 45 and, and number 5, uh, that's that's like modest, but still it's real big. Yep. And the eruption interval, the major eruption period, has been dated to about 297 million years ago. So the end of the Carboniferous. And so some have pointed out that the fact that we're having this rise in CO2 coming out of our glacial period, seeing warm and dry climates, might not be unrelated to the fact that we had this major rift volcanism going on. So the parts of the continent are pulling apart, and that is allowing... A magmatic rise in volcanic activity to happen. And it's 100% makes sense why climate change would match up with these sorts of events, even if it can seem repetitive and convenient that it comes up every time. Well, yeah, I mean, if you think about just like, you know, whatever that <laughs> volcano was called in Iceland or Mount St. Helens, you know, like that caused dramatic global changes short term but like there were huge effects from relatively small eruptions like that's mm -hmm. got nothing out of large igneous province that's right and in fact there are two that have been pointed out at this time the other one is the barguzin vitum large igneous province in asia which is only like 150 oh, thousand square kilometers <laughs> uh, which has been dated to 310 to 275 million which is a long period of time. And at least from the paper I read, it's not clear if it was erupting the whole time or if there were certain big bursts, but it also is happening around this time. So we could potentially have two large igneous provinces pumping CO2 into mm -hmm. the air. Now, I also want to make the point, just as important as it was to mention this, it is also important, I think, to mention that volcanoes are such a tempting target for extinction. And it is always so tempting to point at a thing yes like after paleontologists and geologists came to generally accept that an asteroid impact was associated with the end cretaceous extinction all around the world people went all right well let's go find the craters for all the other mass extinctions yep yep so while i i always like to put a little asterisk like it's not it's not usually one convenient answer but no there were there was a whole lot of heckin' volca volcanism going on at this time. Well, it's even even when, you know, we, we rational, logical scientists are studying something, we're, if, you look, if you are looking for a connection, you're still more likely to find it <laughs> if you yep. look for it every single time. Humans are really good at pattern recognition. <laughs> it's, we are so good at so it. So good. To our own detriment. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so... Whatever the specifics, climate changed, ice house into greenhouse, a change that hasn't really been seen dramatically since then until <clears throat> right now, <laughs> possibly, maybe. And then we're in the Permian. Woo! Allie, would you like uh, to explain to us what the Permian period was like? <sighs> okay, so the overly simplistic answer is that the Permian was the worst. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's an exaggeration. There was a there are cool things from the Permian, but <laughs> golly, I just like I'm gonna be honest, I can't I cannot support the Permian. It killed all my plant friends. It sure did. It just makes me sad. So, like you mentioned, you have all of this climate change through the end of the Carboniferous, all of this drying, and that is just exacerbated in the Permian. Like it's dry like it's i just i just think of this i just think of mars 
Like in my head, the Permian looks like Mars. It is dr- Tatooine. We, I was yes! oh, you beat me too. I was gonna say I was gonna say we went from Camino to Tatooine. Oh, when we were talking earlier and you were like, you know, we went from swamps to dry, I was like, Alright, so Camino to Felucia to Tatooine. I have a planet for all of them. Keep yep. them coming. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, geologic periods are just Star Wars planets because they have yep. a single bio. Um, exactly. So, as you mentioned uh, before, uh, that by this time we have Pangaea. Yes. One mostly giant continent, which also means you have a lot of dry, arid interior. Mm-hmm. You have a lot of seasonality. Mm-hmm. It's it's a rough place to be a plant. Yes. It's also a tough place to be an animal. Yes. Yep. But it was the key to us figuring out plate tectonics. That's yeah. true. Because, because you have this supercontinent, and it was also a plant, so I really want to get this plug in. <laughs> so, so, so during the Permian... Ahem. <laughs> one track mine. So during the Permian, you have this super cool tree called Glossopterus. So that has these tongue leaves, these huge strap like leaves. They're very diagnostic, very distinct. I don't appreciate you calling them tongue leaves. <laughs> bah, 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 bah. That's, no, that's what, no. Glossopterus, no. that's literally what it means. It's no. what they have on those Star Wars planets. <laughs> I, I apologize for the truth. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is becoming a spooky episode. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. But anyway, so you have these really... I'm sorry. These strap-like leaves, these large, flat, elliptical leaves. Thank you. I'm doing this for you, Will. (laughs) So you have these large leaves. uh, So you have these trees. And like I said, these leaves are super distinct. And they were showing up on different continents. Today, what are different continents? Because it was all Pangea. And by putting the puzzle pieces back together, it's always the the kid looking at the, the globe like, I wonder if I could put South America and Africa together. You know, you just like look at the globe and like, I feel like those fit together. And that's basically what people did. We're like, you know, what if you rearrange the pieces? So I guess that's one thing that the Permian has going for it. And we should point out that Glossopterus, this plant you're talking about, is, correct me if I'm wrong, one of those types of plants that did very well following the change to arid to to drier landscapes. Yes, exactly, and that's that's why it is in the the Permian. That's why it's one of the things that did make it through because there are still forests. It's just not like <laughs> continent of forest. Um. <laughs> so, and then this kind of brings me to a question I wanted to pose to you, Allie. Uh, we talk a lot e- each time we talk about the an extinction episode. You know, they're they're apocalyptic. They're terrible. Bad things happen. But as you go through the geologic timescale, every time you hit an extinction, the world after the extinction looks a little bit more like the world that we have today. Yep. Right? The Cretaceous extinction allowed mammals to replace reptiles as the dominant land groups. The megafaunal extinctions at the end of the Pleistocene, episode 25, wiped out all the big things that we don't have now. Mm -hmm. So in this case, right, we lost a lot of our swampy... Uh, uh, moisture-loving plants. We got a lot of these sort of drier adapted, seasonal adapted plants. So my question is, did the Carboniferous rainforest collapse? Was it a step towards the kind of flora that we recognize today? Yes, it is. So as sad as I am that the, like, Dr. Seuss trees are gone, (laughs) it is what set us up for today. So... One of the major groups that did survive are the gymnosperms. So the gymnosperms, today conifers and evergreens, so like pine trees and their friends. (laughs) I was going to call them that, but I was like, that's probably not actually. (laughs) No, that's, so side note, that's one of the things that I teach people when I talk about my research. They're like, I didn't realize that evergreens weren't always conifers. Like, no, there are angiosperms. That are, that can be evergreen. It's just that in temperate regions, it's only conifers. Uh, Is evergreen like the cold blooded of the plant world? (laughs) Yes. I would say yes. Like, I mean, yeah, kind of, but no, there are better things. While we're on this subject, we'll talk about the gymnosperms here in a second, but this, I wasn't sure if I was going to get to bring this up. While I was reading, 
about the distinction between the late, the Carboniferous environments into going into the Permian after the collapse, I came across the term ever wet. Is this a term? Is this like a biome plant term? Yeah. The always damp. Yeah. Yeah. Ever wet is a term. I'd never heard that before. Oh, so I have, but that's because I love biomes. Um, you're a cool person. I'm a cool kid. Yeah. So ever wet is going to be basically like the wettest of the rainforests. So if you think about like kind of like the like the uh, actually no <laughs> this isn't a good example but it, it kind of works so if you think about like Florida and how it rains <laughs> every day yep yep <laughs> okay gotcha yeah so ever wet is going to be the wettest of these tropical environments you basically. It vaguely means there's no seasonality, but it more precisely means, like, these plants are doing great. That's where you're going to get, like, you know the (laughs) gif of David Attenborough hugging the huge leaf saying, I love a good leaf? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Those leaves. You find those in (laughs) Everwet environments. So we've got, we went from (laughs) Everwet to seasonal dry, gymnosperms. Leading into our modern plants as we know them, go. Okay, so gymnosperms are a group of plants that people know. Like, of the trees, they are the second most recognizable <laughs> behind yeah. the pine, only... spruce, fir. Yes. I'm so proud of you guys. Con- conifers. Hey, I did it. <laughs> I'm so proud. Uh, but this also includes, like, ginkgo and friends like that. So conifers are gymnosperms, but there are other friends. But yeah, so gymnosperms are most closely related to angiosperms, which are plants. Like if Episode you're thinking 57. of that was also me. If you're also you, yep. If you're thinking about a plant, it's probably an angiosperm. And so yep. Without and the other thing too is um, gymnosperms are. Oh, I was going to say better adapted, but I don't like that. They have more of these adaptations for seasonality. And as we go through this greenhouse world, we do have variable seasonality globally. The things you have to remember about these high latitudes is that you also have more darkness than you have on the equator. So Mm -hmm. on the equator, you have 12 hours of light and 12 hours of dark all year round, which is actually really weird. Like... Uh, if you're if you're from a temperate area and you spend time on the equator, you're like, it's actually really dark here a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. Half of the time, you might say. But yeah, so not only do do plants living in temperate regions have to adapt to these drastic changes in temperature regimes, so you might have it actually getting below freezing, but you'll also have, depending on how high you are lat- latitudinally, you might be dark for half the year and that's something that plants have to deal with because i don't know if you know this but they need the sun to eat yep (laughs) it's it's really important so that's another type of seasonality that you kind of have to think about so as i mentioned previously um these forests on in antarctica half of the year antarctica is dark so yep so basically it's it's how are they cold adapted? Are they dark adapted? Are they dry adapted? Are these things related? Good job, gymnosperms. But yes, by <laughs> the gymnosperms making it through, it basically gymnosperms are to the Permian what angiosperms are to the Paleogene. Like they were not dominant by any means. But like they were, they were getting a foothold, and then something catastrophic happened, and they were like, "Hey, I'm ready. Like this is my moment." So a lot of the the forests that we're, especially we're familiar with mm-hmm. in North America, and indeed even farther north than any of we are, a lot of those northern forests are now dominated by gymnosperms, where you have a lot of your pine and spruce and things like that. Which is something that was not at all the case before this event. Right. Yeah, so it, it wasn't until you had these drying interiors that the gymnosperms, like, this is my moment. Very cool. Now, I should mention, 
that this was also a time, I know this is an alley episode, but <laughs> there were also some exciting, notable changes in the animals. Yes. Now, uh, there are a couple of trends that happen here. One is that over the course of this period, we see a, a bunch of, a bunch of turnover in animal species, especially on land, which means we lost a bunch of things. We gained a bunch of new things. Early amphibians, mm -hmm. so our sort of stem tetrapods, early tetrapods, the kind of fishy and salamandery things that have been doing so well up to this point, don't do great in this transition, they which do not. makes sense because if you're getting drier and drier, you have less habitats that are water related, which is where amphibians tend to thrive. That's why the amniotic egg that I talked about is key. And indeed, this is a time where we see the beginnings of the rise of amniotes. Woo! Specifically at this time, things that you might even call reptiles. 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 Which would give rise to proper, like, diapsid reptiles and archosaurs, which would go on to dominate the Mesozoic. To be the best. And also at this time, amniotes uh, provide rise to our, the whole discussion in episode 47, synapsids. So you get your dicynodons, you get your gorgonopsids, the things that would ultimately go on to include mammals, in this new world where you kind of have to be able to deal with drier habitats, drier climates, amniotes with their little uh, baby capsule, mm -hmm. their little wet baby capsule, <laughs> did great <laughs> uh, spreading around. Now, I also have seen a couple of papers discussing the relationship between the animal changes and the plant changes. So there was a paper, I think in 2010, that made the point that that habitat fragmentation that, Ali, you were mentioning before, could have had the effect on animals that we've discussed on islands. Yes! Mm -hmm. That it's isolating pockets and populations. You're getting insulism. So now you have insular evolution, you have endemism, so different groups living in different places in isolation evolving separately into diverse forms. But I should also point out that there is a more recent study, I think this was 2018, that examined this and completely disagreed and suggested that what they were instead seeing was increased connectiveness across these open landscapes that allowed for more dispersal to different places, and that spreading of different groups into new places may have driven some of these new evolutionary innovations in this new diversity. Nice. And that amniotes may have done especially well because they were able to disperse mm -hmm. farther in these connected landscapes. Right. So that instead of isolating the forest, it was opening up areas. Exactly. And if you have a wet baby capsule, then you can go for... Episode 92. So if you have this wet baby capsule, then you <laughs> can go further inland, you know, in this dry uh, continental interior. That's absolutely fascinating. One of the things I really like about science is that you can have multiple <laughs> groups of people looking at the same data set being like, oh, I see co two completely different things. And this is why we now, need a time the machine. The 2018 paper said that other paper looked at small scale. We're looking at larger global scale stuff. So they were at the very least arguing that their data was better and more inclusive. But they're also the more recent people to have made a comment on it. And I don't know what the other people on that first paper would have said. So for now, I'll mention both hypotheses. <laughs> <laughs> because as I, 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 there is ongoing well, research. <laughs> yeah, because to go back to the, the puzzle metaphor when we were talking about Pangea and everything, if you only have half the puzzle, we can all look at it and argue about what the picture looks like. <laughs> it's only once you have all the pieces, which we'll never have <laughs> unless we get a time machine. Time machine. <laughs> so, Carboniferous rainforest collapse. Major plant-centric extinction event. So remember when I said I had a brilliant thought? Yes, yes. did you remember, did it? remember it? Okay. Please, please tell so, us. So, remember how I was saying that we are so animal-centric and, you know, our entire time scale is based on animal extinctions? So part of the reason for this is, one, we are animals. Yep. yep. This, is, this is true. But also, in general, plants do not preserve in the same deposits that animal fossils do. That's true. Yes, it is. 
Like the shallow ocean. <laughs> well, there, that's <laughs> also true. Which is what most of our geologic time scale is based on. <laughs> yeah. It's shallow ocean deposits. If for no other reason than sampling there is great. Oh, yeah. But if you were looking at terrestrial sediments, then um, I know of multiple locations where historically people have said, oh, there are no plant fossils there. And that's because they're not found with the vertebrates. But if a paleobotanist goes and whacks some rocks, they're like, I found plenty of plants. So that that's part <laughs> of it, is that there is this perception that plant fossils are rare, and they're not. So like everybody yeah. knows that like petrified wood is super common. It's its utility is limited in many ways, but it is super common. But yeah, people just say, oh yeah, plants, they, they just don't fossilize. And that is just objectively untrue. It's just not in the same environments as animals. Yeah, the, the fossilization conditions, mm-hmm. the ideal conditions are different for animals versus plants. Mm-hmm. So it, t- uh, two different paleontologists going to the same site have different opinions on what kind of fossil site it yes, is. Yes, exactly. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> that is is indeed a brilliant thought, and it segues very nicely into our last little section of this episode, which is that now that we've discussed the Carboniferous Rainforest Collapse, we have a patron question. (gasps) Oh, right. I'm so excited. And since Allie's here, uh, why don't you answer this one? I'm so excited. So, as a reminder for everybody, we have patrons on our Patreon. If you join at a certain level, you get to submit questions for us to answer on the podcast. We've got a whole bunch of them. Patrons keep sending them in. This question is from Michael, and I thought this one was just so very fitting for this episode and this guest. Michael says, In one of your episodes, you made reference to the fact that rainforests aren't good areas for fossilization. Does that mean that the most biodiverse locales in prehistory would be disproportionately underrepresented in the fossil record, Allie? Okay, so I'm going to give a very pedantic answer to begin with. And say, well, no, because we got lots of stuff from shallow oceans. Yep, that's what I was thinking. I was like, we've got reefs. We got lots of reefs. Lots of reefs. So I know that's not what you're asking. So pedantic over. Okay, so (laughs) in some ways, yes. So you're you are. There are two things that you need to think about with uh, deposition and fossilization. So um, you need it to be in an area of deposition, not erosion. So if the locality is in a basin, that is where sediment is being collected, um, versus if it's on a mountain, you're going to have erosion. So low points are going to be filled um, and high points are going to be uh, weathered flat. Okay, so fortunately, um, many rainforests tend to be in more lowland. So possibly basin. So, okay, they got that going for them. However, the other thing that you have to think about is actually, like, is it does it have a chance of being fossilized? So, in general, if you have high temperatures and high precipitation, things are going to break down pretty quickly. And also, the thing about uh, rainforests is because you have so much plant material that is being it's 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 doesn't have seasons so you have this constant deposition of 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 leaf litter and so you have this these decomposers that are constantly working on it and that's the thing you need a situation where that material is rescued from being eaten so it can can become a fossil so in the terrestrial record by and large your best bets for actual preservation are going to be lakes and ponds. So if you have a forest that is next to a lake or a pond, you got a much better opportunity. So I have worked on rainforest uh, fossil sites. So both in New Mexico in the Paleocene and in Kenya during the Miocene. And the thing they both have in common is their proximity to water. So that's the thing that's allowing you to have this preservation. Because if the leaves weren't falling in the mud and then being buried by sediment, we would never know about it. So to answer your question, in some ways, yes, we are missing a lot of this information just because, like, leaves are tasty. But these places of high biodiversity, 
need a lot of water. And that is often due to some sort of ponding or a river. So if you have that sort of situation, you may still have some sort of deposition. So I guess my answer is maybe we're okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it kind of maybe balances out a yeah, little bit. Yeah, so there are definite pros and cons. Like, and that's and that's true of the fossil record in general. Like, you're not gonna get you're not getting everything just by definition. But I think that while this is a definite concern, I think that there is a higher preservation potential than maybe some of us are afraid of. Like when I first started uh, doing paleontology, I was like, well, I'm never going to find a rainforest. Like there's no way. And I've worked on two. So like <laughs> they do exist. Um, but in general, that's probably not going to be the most common, but yeah, basically you need a river. You need a pot. Sinkholes are great. Like, they sure are. Like, I have worked on mul- at um, multiple sinkholes, and let me tell you, like, the preservation in a sinkhole is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody come here. Yes. To East Tennessee. We got a great sinkhole My for you. My yes. favorite thing to tell people is, <laughs> have you heard of the Gray Fossil site? And they'll say no. I'm like, oh, well, have you ever seen a U-Haul with a red panda on the side? And they'll say yes. Yep, like, yep. That's the Gray Fossil site. That's us. <laughs> Well, thanks for asking that question, Michael. Thanks, Allie, for answering it. And thanks for joining us for this episode. This was so much fun. I'm so glad that you impatiently invited me back. And I also appreciate that you tag teamed this with me because I have a grown up job and I have to do that. (laughs) Yeah, it's harder to to plan around things. true. Now, uh, a thing that I didn't do earlier, uh, which I figure I should do, is uh, briefly tell the people what you're doing now and where they can find you if they want to find you. Oh, yes. I have a grown-up job now. So (laughs) I am the paleontology collections manager at the Sternberg Museum of Natural History at Fort Hayes State University, which is in Kansas. (laughs) So uh, (laughs) that was a really long name. So I am in charge of the vertebrate, invertebrate uh, paleontology collections and the geology collections. And we got a little bit of paleobotany that I'm helping with. Uh, It's a lot of fun. So we're trying to figure out what outreach we can do. So they're doing a lot of Facebook live events. I've done one so far, but we're trying to figure (laughs) out more things to do in the future. But yeah, I am responsible for a bunch of Western interior seaway fossils. So there's a big old Mosasaur skull. (laughs) That's nice. Very cool. Episode 71 and 51. (laughs) Okay. And then there's also a uh, a (laughs) protostega. It's a turtle. Cool. That's real cool. cool. Very cool. Yeah. Episode six. Uh, thank you. Waiting for that. Um, we got a beautiful gomphothere jaw. Oh. Episode sixty six. I love this. So, um, yeah, no, it's it's super fun. Um, we've got some pterosaurs. Seventy nine. Okay. And one of the other cool things is, so in addition to all of the really cool Western Interior Seaway, which I haven't really worked with. Um, marine vertebrates before, so that's been fun. But also, uh, we have a Miocene site and I am team Miocene all the way. So the other day I opened up a cabinet and it was just rhino toes. It just made me so happy. All right. Well, we will also put your uh, social media tags in our video description. If people want to follow you on there and we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Yeah. Thanks to our requesters for this episode topic. Thanks to everybody listening Thanks again to Allie for joining us. Like we said, this I think this has been a great uh, bridge from our extinction tradition into our upcoming plants tradition. Yeah, it's pretty perfect. We've got a bunch of cool plant topics we're looking forward to doing. So look forward to that starting episode 105. But start sending in your requests for plants. Uh, you can send in requests for more extinction stuff. We're not just never going to do them again. Yes, We're still going to do it. All topics are welcome. All topics, as always, welcome. But especially plants. <laughs> but especially plants. <laughs> we release episodes every fortnight. We will be back for episode 96 soon. Allie, thanks so much. Good luck with the new position. Thank you. I'm so excited. And we'll see everybody next time. Yeah. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.
Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.